Välkommen till detta seminarium som är en del av en serie seminarier kring icke-tekniska delar av artificiell intelligens. Jag heter Thomas Kvist och jag jobbar på den del av Region Västerbotten som sysslar med regional utveckling. Och jag är projektledare för ett projekt som heter Reg AI. Detta projekt finansieras av Tillväxtverket via Europeiska regionala utvecklingsfonden, Region Västerbotten och Malå kommun. De här seminarierna de är ett samarbete mellan projekt Reg AI, IT och telekomföretagen och förstås seminarieledarnas organisationer. Nu lämnar jag ordet till Lars Lundberg, näringspolitisk expert hos IT och telekomföretagen som har ett speciellt ansvar för AI-området och är en person som har gjort detta, denna seminarieserie möjlig. Tack för det och varsågod. Jag heter Lars Lundberg och jag är näringspolitisk expert på IT och telekomföretagen. IT och telekomföretagen är en branschorganisation inom Almega som också är en del av svensk näringsliv. De tjänsteproducerande företagen finns där. Vi är som sagt var en arbetsgivarorganisation, bransch- och arbetsgivarorganisation som har drygt 1300 medlemsföretag och närmare 100 000 anställda totalt sett. Vad vi gör, vi arbetar med att möjliggöra för branschen att utvecklas. Vi jobbar med både näringslivsfrågor såväl som arbetsgivarfrågor. Och vi är indelade i olika råd på it- och telekomföretagen. Jag ansvarar för rådet för välfärdsteknik och för AI-verksamheten. Inom de här verksamheterna så träffas vi tillsammans. Både det offentliga och näringslivet och lyfter frågor som är centrala för att vi ska få ett genomslag i branschen och för att det offentliga ska kunna köpa upp våra tjänster på ett bra sätt. När det gäller AI så har vi sedan flera år tillbaka en av de större olika konferenserna som heter AI Summit. Och i år, årets AI Summit var extra rolig. Dels därför att vi hade deltagare från kommissionen. Den som är ansvarig i kommissionen för AI och robotik berättade om vad de gör inom ramen för kommissionen och inom ramen för EU. Vilket är spännande och det ger också en bra bild över vad vi måste göra här hemma i Sverige för att vara i framkant. För första gången så delade vi också ut ett pris, årets AI svensk. Och det var mycket roligt och spännande att för första gången få dela ut det här priset. Och Marcus Lingman, läkare från södra delar av Sverige, blev den som fick priset. Det kan vi in på vår hemsida så kan ni se lite mer om, om årets AI svensk och vilka som var finalister i år. Och vi arbetar självklart för att det ska bli ett lika spännande pris i år, årets AI svensk 2021. Vad gör vi mer? Jo. Tillsammans med medlemsföretagen så har vi tagit fram en branschkod för AI, ansvarsfull AI. I den här branschkoden har vi delat in i tre områden. Vi pratar om ett mänskligt och hållbart samhälle. Vi pratar om förståelse, inkludering och förtroende. Det här, det här materialet, branschkoden men också en checklista är ett material som vi kan använda ute i era verksamheter i en dialog tillsammans internt i bolaget eller tillsammans med kunder. Så sagt var så att AI är ett område som vi fokuserar väldigt mycket på och med spänning ska vi se vad som händer under 2021. Tack för mig. Där hittar ni mig. Och... Nu till dagens seminarium. Välkommen Christian Guttman, Tieto Evry. Det är en man som har gjort väldigt, väldigt mycket inom AI-området. Man känner sig som en beige person i jämförelse. Christian leder alla globala AI-utvecklingar och innovation på Tieto Evry, ett av de största IT-bolagen i Europa. Han är adjungerad professor vid University of New South Wales i Australien och forskarassistent vid Nya Karolinska institutet. Han är dessutom en entreprenör som startar flera företag inom området artificiell intelligens. Och jag tror att en del lösningar i alla fall rör sig inom hälso- och sjukvårdsområdet. Förutom det så har han publicerat flera böcker och publikationer inom området artificiell intelligens. Han finns på topp 100-listan av internationella ledare inom området artificiell intelligens 
tillsammans med bland annat sådana som Andrew Eng som ju är väldigt välkänd. Eh, en väldigt välkänd AI-profil. Kort och gott, Christian har både en akademisk, en företagssyn och en eh, entreprenörssyn på AI. Varsågod Christian, varmt välkommen och ordet är ditt. words i mean it's of, of course great to be here and talk about the topic as you said i've been very passionate about the uh topic of artificial intelligence uh there's a lot to gain and i will um just share my screen so that you also can start seeing my presentation um voila i hope this works yes it is it is yeah Yeah, no, no. No? Okay, fantastic. Yes, <clears throat> so um, as was mentioned before, I've been working in this area, particularly around business leadership. Uh, I started businesses and uh, grow businesses, so really looking at the application of artificial intelligence and all the experiences that I have uh, gathered over the years. So I've been working in the Middle East, um, um, the British Telecom in Australia, Australia and the US. Uh, and in all these engagements, AI has always been the primary driver of business uh, creation. And uh, I've been doing this for probably now uh, in the business world for 15 years and um, applying it and doing research uh, for, for much longer than that. Um, but it's super exciting now, of course, to see how this entire ecosystem is developing. And I would like to share with you now a couple of thoughts. So what and and um, the topic here is not picked by random as strategic dimensions and leadership. So what it really has come down to in the last, I would say, two or three years is that many of these AI topics are brought to the CXO level, to the board level, to key stakeholders in the organization or the uh, uh, leaders of health authorities. And so uh, the reason is AI has such a profound impact to the organization and to the ecosystem that this is not something that can be uh, utilized as sort of a side project in some uh, uh, department or some type of uh, proof of concept. So I will go through a couple of topics. And before I go there, I will spend two or three slides just to get, get a refresher on what AI is. Um, uh, you heard it in the last lecture. Uh, you, you got an idea of what it is. When you look um, into the community of, of artificial intelligence, the scientific community, the business community, This actually has been around for 70 years. So this is not something that came up the last five or 10 years. And the general ambition is really all you see here on the left, uh, what we are considering uh, human intelligence, behaviors, decisions that we are making, uh, and uh, tasks that we are performing. Uh, all those uh, things that we can do as humans, we want machines and we want algorithmic algorithms, uh, computer, uh, computation algorithms to actually perform these types of tasks. Whereas on the left, you have essentially organic algorithms, if you want to call it that, that are performing these tasks. And there's cognitive, emotional, physical abilities that are driving this, uh, these sort of uh, behaviors. So it's, um, it, that's the underlying idea of artificial intelligence, and it has started from the 1950s, essentially, and onwards to today. And these, this community has become extremely vibrant, very wide. And in the next slide, you see essentially a short overview of these many different areas. Um, the first one is really about laying the groundwork about what is AI and what isn't AI. This is, um, this is uh, still a big discussion. Uh, includes questions like whether a system is conscious and when it becomes conscious, so pretty broad questions. And all this matters, of course, when you start applying it in a business environment. You know, it's, it's a naturally very important question. Uh, there's a lot of AI on areas like um, how you're representing knowledge and how you're doing reasoning, meaning, well, how do you come to conclusions? How does the system make, make decisions? You see also game theory as one of those areas, for example, in multi-agent systems, which is decision decisions made among several AIs. Uh, you have problem solving, the area of problem solving, which is about heuristic search, for example. Uh, and then also natural language processing, which is a hot topic now, of course, in machine perception, which is used for image recognition and seeing details there. Um, and of course, also planning. Planning is a very big area in knowledge and reasoning. 
And finally, machine learning, which is probably where the most buzz is on these days. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Andrew Nung was mentioned before. Uh, he promoted the um, and promoted and shared the idea of how you're applying supervised learning essentially in settings uh, such as uh, online uh, retail and so on. And that has been extremely successful, creating billions of dollars of market share, if not tens and hundreds of millions, because you have essentially companies like uh, Baidu and Amazon and so on that are utilizing these technologies. So this is a bit the background around the, the technology, but the, the, the important part, I guess we have many in the audience here, which are uh, actually very um, much in the business uh, uh, area. And the reason why AI has become so prominent now in discussions across the board in industry, in, uh, in, in um, government organizations, is that uh, business changes substantially. So there's a profound <laughs> impact on the ecosystem. Uh, many analyses uh, done by big uh, uh, organizations, such as uh, you know, McKinsey or Wired and, and many others, uh, have essentially estimated the impact in PwC, the impact of being 16 trillion US dollars, so 15.7 trillion US dollars by 2030, changing a lot of the tasks and the businesses that are performed today. Jobs will change according to the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Uh, there will be many new jobs created and many um, old ones lost. Uh, and then also, for example, due to this enormous interest, it is a, it is a very demanding um, environment. There are very few experts in the world currently that actually do have this knowledge, uh, this technical knowledge uh, and also business knowledge. And then at the same time, understanding what it means for the ecosystem. So. Uh, uh, Wired and New York Times have estimated the number of experts somewhere at 10,000 um, in the world. And I often highlight that, that means in practice that we have about five in Sweden, uh, three in Finland and three in Norway. And uh, we are in fact the netto exporter of this talent to other uh, countries in the world. Okay, so look, this is a bit of background. You know, there are other um, uh, YouTube presentations uh, if you like to go much deeper into these topics. Uh, I've shared them, so if you um, type in my name on YouTube, uh, you will find a couple of presentations which are much wider and they go into many different topics, like if finance and banking is your area, or if uh, the public sector is your area of, of industry, or you're interested in AI and ethics, then please, uh, uh, you can look up more. But in this talk, I would like to focus much more on strategy and leadership. And um, what I will do here, Let's see if we get through them all, uh, but I will give you a glimpse of the eight ducks that I'm calling, eight, eight ducks that need to be in order in, uh, to be successful uh, on your journey, on your AI journey of becoming a company that really puts AI and data-driven solutions at the center of your decision-making, which is essentially, which, which is as essential as having, uh, uh, for example, electricity at the core of your business. So unthinkable that any business today would be working without electricity, but that 100 years ago when electricity got introduced was certainly a question for many businesses, and some have decided not to go down this path, which and needless to say that these businesses don't exist. And so it's a very similar situation with AI technology, data-driven technology. This is essential to any business, and the earlier you, you understand and hop on board and make changes in your organization, the better. Now, uh, I will be essentially going through and trying to address um, the spectrum from grassroots movements, so when employees become engaged to boardrooms. So all of this needs to be aligned. And the question really behind all this is, well, how ready are you um, uh, in order to uh, really perform in this area well? Um, so first, starting with the boardroom. So um, if, you are, uh, a, uh, if you are a company, then, of course, you as a leader, as a, as a CXO, as a CEO, have the board to report to, and they will set the agenda. They are the main stakeholders of the organization. So they are uh, suggesting where to go. And then, of course, the question is, what risk reward is the boardroom wanting to take uh, They this, in this new era of AI? So uh, since it is a new technology, you need to take risks which are unusual to the business. Uh, you need to also understand and think about what foresight you uh, or what how you look, would like your company to be um, active in three or five years' time. So thinking strategically about how you position yourself in this new market, 
um, and also what you can, what value you can deliver to this market in this new ecosystem when really many products and services rely on data-driven uh, solutions. Um, uh, and of course, a very important part, and I see this uh, lacking a lot in boardrooms these days, is that you need someone in these boardrooms which has a very good and deep understanding, understand, understanding of uh, how AI can be applied to the business and how it changes the potentially the organization, which I will come back to in a in a in a couple of slides. And also uh, this entrepreneurial understanding in the in the board, uh, seeing okay, how can you, uh, what type of risks are reasonable uh, and which type of solutions are scalable. So these are uh, these are some of those uh, things that I'm seeing are very important in boardrooms, and they set the agenda. Uh, I hope straight to employees. Um, I, I think I want to make one point of what I've observed in many, many organizations across the board, whether it's public entities or industrial uh, companies, uh, you have some employees that have been very active. They are very interested in this technology. They have been seeing how this technology is applied in their own sectors, so whether it's in the recruitment space or in the finance space where you do loan risk assessments or uh, you start to uh, uh, perform applications automatically. <clears throat> and um, you see employees being really engaging. Uh, they're enthusiastic. They want to understand the technology. And this is something as a leader you would want to cherish. You would want to first leverage these experiences to the leadership level, to the board level, to understand what these uh, what these advanced technologies have been doing to the company. So if you have a successful proof of concept or even better proof of value, uh, demonstrating the success, showing what it has done, and also rewarding and highlighting the success of these uh, projects in the employees. So appreciate and study these grassroots projects. They are very important. On the other hand, of the spectrum when it comes to employees, uh, you also see a lot of employees that are actually not engaged. So they they are very they are um, they are uh, scared that the changes will be quite fundamental to their own job, to their own tasks. To that end, I often say, by the way, that AI does not um, replace jobs, but it um, eliminates tasks essentially so the job constellation of what you will be doing in your job will change and in all almost all cases you are essentially looking at the more high value generating tasks that you're then performing as an employee <clears throat> so the more tedious and boring tasks will go away but nevertheless you have of course employees that are concerned also getting more increasingly concerned about the application of ai that's why in the eu um, and also in Sweden and in the Nordic countries, we have many um, AI ethics discussions, new regulations. The AI agenda was published yesterday by Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Bailan, the Minister of Enterprise, uh, which we also have contributed to. And but these are very important uh, topics to follow, and many employees will also get very interested in these, these topics. So you see a spectrum between very enthusiastic employees and those that, uh, uh, those that raise valid questions. So, Good to have answers, good to think about, get, good to get everyone on board. Um, then, of course, you as the CEO, as the leader uh, in the organization, very important, uh, learn the art of the possible. Um, there is an example of uh, uh, a leader, the chairman of Nokia, uh, this, the um, Vista Silasma, and he has, in fact, gone back to the bench and learned with my colleague Andrew Nang in Stanford. Uh, to understand what AI and machine learning actually can do. It's, in my opinion, a great example. I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning it because it also influenced um, the way how the Finnish parliament has learned about AI. They, in fact, now are obliged to have courses uh, or need to learn about AI on a very, very basic level, of course. But that is something that is very, very important. Um, also very important, this is very fundamental to your business. So the sec to the second point that I mentioned here, don't let outsiders determine your future. So you need to, this is a very fundamental technology. It is something that you need to get your head around. It is not something that you can postpone or outsource really. Um, so, so, and to that end, um, you need to be really looking at hiring the best people that you can get in the sectors. Uh, so for example, uh, looking at the CAIO, a chief AI officer, uh, I often say, uh, you know, put that CAIO next to you 
uh, and have as many coffees and chats with that uh, with that person as possible, and um, see what what is actually possible with this technology. Uh, you know, get ideas as to where it could be applied. What sort of tedious, highly repetitive tasks in the organization could be could be augmented? Uh, how you can improve products? How you can improve the quality of your services? The application areas are vast. Uh, you can it influences practically all businesses, all businesses, all workflows in the organization. But get a feel as to what it can actually do. Um, and again, similar to electricity, it's very hard to grasp it if you don't really talk to an expert that has both the imagination on the technical basis in order to really have this uh, discussion. So, and then, <clears throat> of course, around the data. Sometimes there's a misconception that um, AI technology and data, it's a very, very complex, big, uh, big endeavor that you need to get into. And um, in fact, uh, I would like to say that, yes, in some cases, it might be beneficial to look at data at rest or legacy uh, legacy data, as, as you sometimes might call it, where you have collected data over decades and they are all uh, on-prem uh, and, um, you know, could be CRM systems or could be system, or journal systems in the healthcare system, or it could be information about your machines and manufacturing. Uh, and then there's this idea that you need to turn all this into like clouds, uh, cloud environments, and it will be a big integration process. So that may, may sometimes be necessary, but you always need to ask and start with the question and work your way back from, well, what is the AI application domain? Where do you want to make an impact? And then go back and see what is necessary, what type of data is necessary to have. Uh, uh, and that sometimes it turns out that you don't actually need that much data to unleash a huge amount of potential in your organization. Um, in fact, it is also uh, the case that certain AI technologies don't need any data at all. So uh, I'm referring here to, if you're interested, to the um, uh, to the Google uh, AlphaGo <clears throat> Zero approach, which some of you might be familiar with, but the AI has essentially been given the rules of the game, the rules of the problem that you want to solve, and it's um, created its own space to solve the problem better than any human player could ever uh, uh, ever create. And so, in that, in these cases, my team has been investigating the potential of these types of uh, approaches. You don't really need any data at all, and you have have a big impact to the problems and the business problems you want to solve. So, uh, and finally, <clears throat> to the last point, you create sources of data, use external data. Um, so it is possible in many environments that you don't need to look at the data that has already been collected over long periods of time and go tediously through the process of transferring it. Instead, you can think of many applications, for example, applying cameras in a, in a factory setting. Uh, and then through cameras or maybe other sensors that you might be putting up there, uh, you will detect uh, anomalies, uh, problems, errors in the way how the product is, has been created. And these setups are very fresh and new. So from day one, you can decide what data formats you, you want to have, what type of data you need to collect in order to do good analyses. And you can also augment this type of data with external, uh, uh, with external data too. So here, for example, if you have uh, systems that depend on also on weather, well, naturally you can link in weather data into the way you're predicting how your systems perform, right? So there's a lot you can do in this space and it's, uh, uh, it is often not as complex and, and tedious as one might think. Finally, uh, not finally, actually we're still in the middle of here, <clears throat> but um, organizational changes. So is it um, business as usual? Well, the answer is no. Uh, uh, one of the advices is don't fragment uh, or centralize the AI efforts uh, too early. So uh, when you are having an AI team, um, what I'm seeing is we start to move from the first wave of um, AI approaches in organizations where you have experts, only experts that are uh, technical experts, and they are often given a bunch of data, and then they are expected to do a lot of great things with the data. Well, that is that was fine, let's say, to test things out a couple of years ago. But now we are moving to the second stage where these teams are getting also the mandate and the cap capacity and competences to uh, make changes in the organization. Uh, because once you have the great outcome of an application of AI, uh, generally the organization tends to be more resistant in fully implementing that. Right? And there's a couple, there's of course many reasons sometimes for that to be the case. But um, 
you need to also give these uh, teams, they need to be augmented, you need to give them the power, the mandate, the budget, and the talent uh, uh, to also make business decisions. Another another advice is, and that I'm seeing a lot is, there's these sort of extreme <clears throat> approaches. One is that you centralize every effort in AI, but then you're sort of losing what's happening on the edges. You know, what do customers say? What do you know about the product? So fully centralizing it is probably not all, always a good idea, but fully uh, Decentralizing it is certainly not a good idea either. So if that's probably worse because then you have many AI initiatives happening across the organization. You create parallel agendas with a new technology, uh, and this fragmentation can create uh, significant integration problems later on. It's a bit like when you think of electricity 120 years ago. There were basic questions answered around: uh, Do you have AC or DC? Right? What voltage do you have? So imagine this. Oh, Parallel discussions are happening in AI. So what data formats do you use? Which sort of AI ethics are you following? How do you implement the algorithms? <clears throat> and so on. So if you have a if you have in your organization and in your products different standards across the organization, it is extremely tedious to later on sort of integrate them. Uh, so and apart from the fact that it is very costly. So um, that is something that I, I strongly uh, encourage you to think about. Happy to go into detail because every business, every industry is slightly different here, of course. A next point is where the next duck that you need to align and think about is where do you find the AI talent and how do you keep them? Um, uh, so first, this is still a an area of business which requires uh, which requires the best possible talent that you can find on the market. So it's very, it's extreme talent that you that you need. And that is still very rare. It's very hard to find and um, and also very hard to keep. It is worth noting that we in Europe have great talent, but we are netto exporters of those that are business driven. And by, by that, I mean that you find many of our great graduates of the greatest talents uh, in California or in Austin and Texas and Montreal, in Shenzhen in China. They go there and in part, they feel attracted to the projects that are uh, that are offered, right? So I have, you know, there's one anecdote that I often use, but as a good friend who went to the, um, went to the US because he wanted to essentially, he believed in a, in a vision, right? Sending, sending robots to Mars. That, that is what he wanted to do. And when I asked him, oh, why don't you try to do that in Europe? It was many years back, but he said, well, it's not, not possible. Yet. So you need to, and we need to in an ecosystem, but you as an individual in a company and a CEO, you need to really draw a, um, a vision of how you can make a big difference and then attract good talent to your organization. Yes, and of course, there's always a question, well, when you have new technology, how do you approach it? In which area? Do you co-innovate? So do you find a partner? You buy it, you buy AI uh, technologies and uh, the business impact with it, or do you build AI yourself? So very important here, and I see this also more in the ecosystem, there are more and more uh, companies which I would uh, refer to as not to perhaps completely AI fake, but they are not AI first. So many of them, they have heads of AIs, and you, I strongly encourage you to look deeply into their background if they don't have a PhD or a very, very strong record uh, uh, in, in AI, in the application of AI, understand the technology, understand what it means to the business, um, uh, this is not the partner you want to have. You would need to and want to have a partner which has strong knowledge in this area. They really know what they are doing. Uh, it, there are so many complicated pitfalls in this, uh, in this AI area, which have to do a lot with the technology, you know, how the data. Uh, is utilized, avoiding biases in the data, comparing different algorithms. Uh, and this is very, very uh, fundamental questions you need to answer, and they require very deep knowledge. Uh, and so find partners that have that very deep knowledge. Be very rigorous in your due diligence and understanding what these partners have in terms of talent. Don't. Uh, uh, what happens too many times is now that there are titles given out in organizations where when you look behind it, unfortunately, it's not people that do actually have the quality and the depth in this area. So be very, very careful with the due diligence here. Um, I think this is my 
eighth duck, if I counted correctly. So we might be uh, having this last one. But the um, <clears throat> uh, it's really important to build the strategy, as I mentioned before. The board, uh, the CEO, and also looking closely to the employees. Well, what and the products and services, of course, that you're developing. Well, what is that AI strategy and the roadmap that you are developing? How will your company look like in this new era where more and more data is available? What well, all this data is used by your competitors and by your customers in order to improve products and services? What role will you take in this ecosystem in three or five years' time when this technology is mature, when many use this sort of technology, uh, and when, when you need to essentially uh, not just survive, but ideally compete and outcompete others? So that's that's a very important point. And to that end, what's happening now, because AI is and data-driven solutions are so, let's say, um, they are quite demanding, there is now a lot of regulation coming in and new uh, guidelines from governments. The EU, uh, Ursula von der Leyen just last week has said that she believes in AI. And what that also means from an EU perspective, there are new regulations coming in. Many of you are familiar with the GDPR. <clears throat> we will have very soon a um, new regulation around AI and data, how data is shared, uh, how which type of AI applications can be used and, and how, and which which people, which qualified people can be using AI or not. Similar to the healthcare sector, not everyone can perform an operation of, uh, of prescribed medicine, right? So, so this will come. There will be certain people that need to be qualified, that need to be properly going through training, which, by the way, at TFR we are doing. We have an AI ethics certificate there. So, um, so that is something that is, is coming and you need to take this into account when you are looking at your own uh, roadmap too. So very quickly, I think we can, I can go back to this slide uh, when we are taking a couple of questions, but this is sort of in summary uh, what you have heard now before. Um, I will just very briefly mention two more slides and then <clears throat> we are at the end. One is just a little bit more about my organization, so Tieto Every. Many of you are familiar with us, I assume, I hope. Uh, we are the largest IT and software business in the Nordics with 24,000 professionals globally. Uh, we have a turnover of 3 billion. Uh, we're serving customers in over 90 countries. We have 10,000 in the Nordics. So we have a very strong footprint here um, and very much digital uh, and uh, data-driven approaches are, are very much in our focus. And finally, if you are interested to go deeper, to work with us as a partner or um, co-innovator, uh, then please reach out. Uh, the way we work very briefly is that we offer strategic advisory. So um, if you are in a strategic position, the CEO, the CXO, or a main stakeholder, the board, we're happy to go in, go deeper, present um, our view on how your business will change. Um, another uh, thing that we are doing are proof of value accelerators. So we're analyzing data <clears throat> and, un, and, and providing you a proof of value. So I, I, uh, the difference with proof of concept is that in a proof of value, you actually can see what the outcomes are and you can build a business case. And finally, continuous AI services. So once you have AI in place, it needs to be maintained uh, because you know you will have machine learning, the systems will learn. They will update based on the environment, and there will also be new regulations that need to that change the way how the system operates. So that's very briefly, and I take this. Maybe the last comment here is: please reach out. Uh, you see here, uh, I'm on Twitter. I share very regularly thoughts. LinkedIn, uh, you're welcome to uh, to uh, connect. Uh, I'm also on Clubhouse. Uh, many might you might be familiar with Clubhouse. We have a session every Friday at 1 p.m. Um, Yes, I think this is my last slide, and I go back to this overview and open up for questions. So back to Thomas to moderate, and they can be in Swedish and in English, of course. Thank you. Tack så hemskt mycket. Jätteintressant. Som sagt, ni kan gärna använda den handuppräckningsfunktionen, och den finns ju bakom den här gubben som håller upp en hand här i Teams. Och... Som sagt, engelska, tyska var det väl också. Ja. Ska. Så varsågod. Fråga på. Ska vi se här. Vi väntar här. I, i väntan, där kommer en Jerry. Varsågod. Ja, tack. 
Eh, jag har väl egentligen en lite mer övergripande just där. Om du har någonting som du rekommenderar att man läser på eh, om man är i en roll som systemutvecklare på ett industriföretag. Jag, jag vill lära mig mer om AI i mera i grunden att eh, läsa på mer kring det om du har någonting att rekommendera där. Ja, absolut. Um, jag menar, ja, mm, som du säger, beror lite på vad, vad du vill uppnå. Det är din första fråga. Men om du vill ha lite mer bas um, och förstå bred de områdena som jag nämnde tidigare så rekommenderar jag alltid den här Artificial Intelligence and Modern Approach. Det är liksom en, en, ett kärnbok. Alla känner till det inom, inom området. Den är ganska tjock. Jag tror det är 1500 sidor. Men du kan, du kan ta ut de bitarna som du tycker är, är bäst. Det är alltså, som sagt Artificial Intelligence and Modern Approach by Stuart and Russell. Det finns nu en fourth edition som har kommit ut nu senast. Ja, tack. Mm-hmm. Ja, då har vi Nathan Ros. Hej, tack så mycket. Jätteintressant. Jag jobbar med att bygga broar mellan industri och akademi i rymdbranschen. Och just nu nästa vecka har vi ett seminarium som handlar om hur vi ska få ett större förståelse för all den här rymddata som vi har. Mm. I form av satellitdata egentligen. Och hur, hur vi ska samla en massa företag i vår region för att berätta om de affärsmöjligheter som finns här. Och då är det naturligtvis väldigt intressant att veta. Har du någon erfarenhet av att jobba med AI kopplad till rymddata? Ofta stora mängder som kanske har funnits sedan både 2030 bland 40 år tillbaka. Mm, mm, mm. Ja, absolut. Ja, vi har faktiskt jobbat med, med satellitdata och rymddata på olika sätt. Jag kan bara super snabbt ge två snabba exempel. Men jag, jag, vi kan gärna ta en längre diskussion efter, efter seminariet. Den, den ena är ju att vi har mycket um, skogs, uh, alltså mycket skog uh, business här i Norden. Alltså part and, and uh, paper uh, och tre. Så det finns ju mycket data kring det. Och vi har gjort en del saker med det, liksom förändringar, uh, se vilka, uh, hur en skog utvecklar sig under tiden när man är klar att faktiskt ta uh, uh, eller liksom en harvest liksom. Uh, Uh, träd och um, ja, det finns en del där. En annan sak är ju uh, sustainability and environmental impact. Det finns också en del som används här. Alltså till exempel pollution uh, som vi har kollat på. Så det finns, finns en del och jag kan gärna, vi kan gärna one on one eller senare genom mail uh, kan jag berätta lite mer och uh, dela lite mer. Men det finns en del och det är super, ett mycket spännande område. Mm. Jag, tänk, jag tänker på det just att man uh... Man kan, man kan locka som sagt, om, nu har du pratat väldigt mycket till företag. Jag vet inte om alla som är med här är företag eller om det är väldigt mycket LTU, Thomas. Ja, det, det här är alltså inriktat mot företag, de här scenarierna. Ja, okej. Okay. Eh, och har LTU halkat med på, via näringslivskontoret i Skellefteå kommun, tror jag. Just det, ja. Själv sitter jag ju i Kiruna då, men vi, vi jobbar ju utifrån rymdperspektivet. Och jag, jag kan gärna lägga in i chatten här så kan jag lägga in inbjudan till vårt seminarium nästa vecka. För att vi är ju väldigt intresserade av att hitta mogna företag som har en högteknologisk mognad för att titta både på AI men också ta sig an stora mängder rymddata. Så jag lägger in den i chatten här så får ni, ja ni får gärna rista er, det är ett öppet seminarium. Så välkomna. Ja så. Jerry, hade du till frågan eller en gammal hand? Det är en gammal hand, jag får inte bort det. Okej, okay. ja, ja. en fråga som jag har här, jag undrar, det finns ju många små företag i Västerbotten. Finns det någon stor skillnad mellan hur de ska agera jämfört med det du har beskrivit här? Mm. Mycket bra fråga. Alltså, eh, jag var med i... Um... I ett projekt Gaia X i, i Tyskland. Uh, det är ett stort, en stor cloud service som vi kanske ska ha. Alltså lika stor som till exempel uh, Amazon eller Google eller de som vi känner till. Men en stor, en stor fråga är ju hur tar vi med de här SMEs, alltså small, small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, de, 
det finns utmaningar som de ibland har. Som, alltså när du har ett stort företag, de kan samla in data på sina maskiner eller services eller något. De kan ha mycket data ganska snabbt. Men det är ju jättesvårt för små företag att tävla, att vara med där. Och det, för det, det betyder alltså hur kan du ha tillgång till data? Hur kan du ha tillgång till data som är labelt och förberett att göra analyser, att göra, använda AI på? Så det är faktiskt en stor utmaning och det är svårt. För ett litet företag eller ett mindre stort företag att först ha budget, ha talang, att ta med alla de bitarna, att kolla på regulation. Så som man försöker öka eller minska tröskeln för, för mindre stora företag i hela Europa och i Sverige för, för, för dem att komma in och använda teknologi. Det, det gäller startups såväl som företag som redan finns i 40 år. Um, och en sak. Som är viktigt att veta här är att en regulation som kommer in nu snart, förmodligen om ett eller två år, är ju den här data sharing aspekt. Liksom hur kan man ha tillgång eh, till eh, nyckel, viktig data som kan vara viktigt för dina tjänster och dina produkter eh, utan att vara en, eh, en Ericsson eller en, en, en HM eller något. Så att försöka jämna ut lite landskapet då, inom den AI-sektorn att inte bara de stora får använda data. Um, så det, blir, det är ju redan nu ganska tydligt tror jag, för de flesta att de stora bolagen i USA, Amazon, Google etc. De har ett extremt monopol. Det, vi försöker nu i Europa jämna ut det lite grann så att vi har en chans här att, att, att vara med på, på banan. Annars blir det alltså faktiskt en, ett problem på lång sikt. Så att säga. Så, ja. mm. Det är ett kommentar. Det finns mycket mer. Men... Ja, ja. ja, tiden börjar. Det är något som har en kort, snabb fråga. Jag ser inga händer uppe. Då, så, då håller vi tiden ganska exakt här. Jag får tacka dig Kristina så oerhört mycket. Det är ett väldigt intressant seminarium. Väldigt, väldigt spännande. Och som sagt, vill ni titta på det igen så kommer det att finnas på Regionens Youtube-kanal om ett par dagar. Tack Christian och tack alla ni andra. Tack själv. Tack själv.